Tonight, it's a real pleasure to welcome Paul Erickson, who is going to discuss his book, Don't Mess With Me, The Strange Lives of Venomous Sea Creatures. Paul has written five or six books. He's a freelance writer, an exhibit developer, an artist, and he also works as an educator on the ship Endeavor, which is a research vessel based in, in Salem, Massachusetts. Paul and I go back, we work together at the New England Aquarium, and there's another refugee from the New England Aquarium in the back, uh, <coughs> Greg Stone. The three of us worked together for a number of years there. Paul worked there much longer than I did. He was there for 26 years, and um, he also has served as a special correspondent for ABC's Good Morning America on WBZ in Boston. He's a multi-talented guy, and um, it's a very fascinating book with excellent photographs, and Paul will sign books afterwards. I'm sure you've noticed that there's a party going on out in the Great Hall. It's a, a Google group, uh, so we have to leave by the door you came in, and uh, we'll, if anybody who wants to buy a book will circle around and go into the gift shop that way. So, please join me in welcoming Paul Erickson. See, the thing about Jerry is uh, he, he, he does something that people used to do that I admire, and that is handwritten correspondence. And there's an old joke, nothing says it like email. Well. <laughs> It's ironic, but he uh, he sent me he always sends me a holiday handwritten note or a thank you note, and he's a busy guy, um, so I am going to take a page out of his book and vow to do more handwritten correspondence. The other thing is, some of you may not know that he was a superb basketball player, but you'll have to dis discuss that with him uh, sometime. So. Jerry hand wrote a note to me. I sent him a book, and he said, why don't you come out and talk? And uh, it's fun to be in Long Beach, um, but what's with these purple trees? Um, <laughs> I feel like I've stepped into the Yellow Submarine movie or something. We, back in New England, they're mostly green. And it's not, it, from a distance, it's not like it's flowering purple. The whole tree looks purple. So we, we continue to find surprises out here. So we can get started here. I'm going to get used to the uh, system. Yeah, this is our, our new book. And I think I'll just start by reading uh, the opening. Give you a little, just introduce it to you. In the warm tropical waters of the wide Pacific, a tiny octopus, its body not much bigger than a walnut, creeps across a coral reef. We're going to get this. Oh, thank you. I guess I don't follow directions very well. Thank you. A tiny octopus, its body not much bigger than a walnut, creeps across a coral reef. Nearby, a crab armed with sharp, powerful claws is ready to attack any intruder. The octopus inches closer to the crab. Is it sliding into a death trap? Not likely. The octopus brings a decisive weapon to this encounter, a deadly neurotoxin produced by bacteria living in its salivary glands. The eight-armed mollusk grabs the crustacean and bites through its shell with a bird-like beak. Lethal venom seeps into the crab and shuts down its nervous system. It can't move its muscles. Its fearsome claws become useless. Its gills no longer absorb absorb life-giving oxygen from seawater. The octopus feasts on a fresh seafood dinner. So some of you may be familiar with this, uh, this creature. This one here is a little bit more camouflaged. And most of the pictures I'll be showing you tonight were taken by my collaborator, Andrew Martinez, who's a much better underwater photography photographer than I am. And I think his pictures are the best part of the book by far. Um, Since I know there's some kids tuning in to this, or will be some classrooms, 
Um, I, I just want to put out a little, a little advice from an old guy. And rule number one when it comes to venomous creatures is respect them and leave them alone. And the second rule is refer to rule number one. Respect them and leave them alone. Most of the animals that I'm talking about tonight, even those that are potentially deadly, most of them are very passive. They don't come looking for you. And most injuries result from people messing with them or purely by accident. But the chances of anybody, any, kid, any kids or adults, being seriously injured by a venomous sea creature is highly unlikely. How many of you have experienced a bee sting? Pretty much everybody. How many of you have experienced a jellyfish sting? Ron. Huh. My friend Ron's here from high, my high school buddy. Thank you for coming. How many of you have experienced an FBI sting? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, uh, I live a charmed life. I know we're talking about water tonight, but uh, every once in a while I come out to Southern California to visit relatives, and thank you for inviting me. And I'd also like to say, Jerry, thank you for inviting me, and Linda Brown, who made all the arrangements for me to be here, was fantastic. So thanks, thanks to everybody here. So I visit uh, folks in, in uh, Orange County, and I, I take my camera around, and one day, a couple of years ago, I was looking for a particular rattlesnake that is of interest to me, and it's called the Southern Pacific Rattler. And I traveled around in the uh, hills, and I hadn't found any. And then I returned to a residential area, and I was walking up a, a little trail, and I guess you know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> so I'm walking up in my sandals, because I didn't expect rattlesnakes in this neighborhood. And there's a house up here, and a house up here, and a playground. And I look down, and I'm about to step on a, looks like a, 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 an indigenous Native American belt, a beaded belt. And I didn't step on it. I saw it before I stepped on it. And it was a Southern Pacific Rattler. And it went on its merry way into a little bush. Didn't bother me. I didn't bother it. I was able to take its picture. And if I am taking pictures of snakes, I usually do, or venomous snakes, I usually do it, and this applies to venomous sea snakes too, I usually uh, keep my distance, like a, a half mile, something. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't mess with them. Um, I have done a lot of diving, not as much as my friend Greg up here, Greg Stone, who's a great oceanographer. Um, but, um, I've, I've, I've done enough diving to know that I am basically a chicken, and uh, I have no problem with it. I did have another little uh, near run-in. Uh, I was in the, uh, in the islands of Fiji, and out there, a lot of it's vertical diving. You're diving on pinnacles. And I was on top of a pinnacle, and the current really picked up. And I've got my yellow submarine camera there. This was a few years ago. Remember film, that plastic stuff you put in cameras? Well, this was a film camera. <laughs> I, I prefer film. And uh, it was a very heavy camera. So I had, was holding on to a dead piece of coral, not a live piece of coral. You don't touch live coral or anything that's alive on a reef. Hanging on, and the current picks up. And I look over about six inches, and I see this thing looking at me. Now, I, I don't know if you can tell what that is, but see if I can in this angle. There's an eye, there's a mouth, and it's a, a stonefish, and it's covered in algae. And man, was I glad I didn't grab the wrong piece of dead coral with algae growing on it, because it probably would have meant I had to do an emergency ascent, be in tremendous pain, probably get an airlift back to the main hospitals uh, in Fiji, and uh, potentially lethal animal. Anyway, it would really hurt. <laughs> so uh, I, I've been really lucky, and I, I hope to keep it, keep it that way by uh, exercising a little common sense in respecting these animals.
Maybe some of you have been here down to Grand Cayman. This is my wife Susan, who's here tonight, and she's had her first encounter with southern stingrays. Right now, she was feeling a little bit overwhelmed, and I just want to clarify that we did not go looking for these stingrays to bother them. They came to us because we had their favorite food, and I understand there's a squid in the audience. Is that true? I thought somebody came in with this great outfit. Well, as it turns out, their favorite food is rotting squid that you leave out for a few days, and you have a little squirt bottle, and in they come. And these, these rays have the personality of puppies. They still have their stingers, some of which are maybe four or five inches long. But as you can see, they're very passive. Here's another one of Andy's pictures. I think this is from uh, South Pacific. Um, so, by the way, Sue, I wonder if I could get a, some water, a glass of water. I forgot to bring one up. Oh. No, uh, that'd, that'd be great, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Blue-spotted stingray, and the thing about stingrays, is just think of all the cars they've sold. It was a brilliant for, for Chevrolet to come up with a Corvette Stingray. And when I was in high school, all the kids wanted them. I still do. Um, it probably wouldn't have sold as well if it was, say, the, um, the Corvette Flounder. There, there's just something about the Stingray that's a, a really cool animal. My friend Heather at the New England Aquarium, where I used to work, uh, I'd like to tell, tell you a little story about uh, a run-in Heather had with uh, a stingray. And I'm going to read some of her quotations here, too. Well, she was diving in our giant ocean tank. Oh, great. Thanks for the monitor. And she, we used to go diving in the tank, and often the cow-nosed rays would come, and you've got some beauties here, would come down, and they'd grab your hair and start pulling on it. So the fact that my hair is thinning on top, it's, it's just a stingray. It'll, it, it, it'll grow back. And they, it didn't hurt. Uh, they just liked sitting on your head and waiting for their food. One day Heather was in there, and that happened to her. A ray wound up on her head. Thank you, Linda. With ice, great. You're so great. Can you keep it up here? No, I don't want to do that for the camera. So here's what Heather, how Heather recalls it. I interviewed her. She said, I put up my hand to lift the ray off my head and felt a sharp pain. I thought a fish might have bitten me. I grabbed my thumb and applied pressure to stop the bleeding because I didn't want any visitors looking into the tank and noticed that I was bleeding. And I can relate to that because it's the old hold on to the thumb trick when, you're when something bites you in there. I was bitten by a moray eel. It was my own fault. And uh, I had to do the same thing to come so the visitors didn't freak out and see blood. Um, and she continues to say, uh, I went to one of the Boston hospitals as the pain got even worse, the worst pain I had ever experienced. I waited in the waiting room what seemed like forever and told the hospital staff, I just can't take this pain anymore. So a doctor, at this point, realized they didn't realize it was envenomated. It's supposed to be a fish bite. Doctor put my hand in ice, which is the worst thing you can do when venom is involved, because usually hot water is a treatment to denature the venom. And as it turned out, the pain, the, the pain was finally put under control somehow. And Heather, Heather said, well, I uh, came back and somebody said, gee, I was looking at one of the cow nose rays and it looked like it had started to grow back a spine. Because what aquariums will often do for safety is they'll clip, clip the spines from stingrays. Uh, just, it doesn't hurt the animal. Uh, it's like clipping your fingernails but it ensures the safety of the diver. And what happened was she reached up, there was a little bit left of the, sp the spine started to grow back. Stingrays don't inject venom. It's 
the spine is surrounded by a venomous sheath. So when it cuts you, it often cuts through the sheath and it will also enter the, um, the wound. And uh, Heather, Heather had a rough day. It was very, very painful. And she said, she said um, it didn't swell up, but her arm felt. She said the sense that these venoms are strange, that her arm had turned into a big balloon. It's kind of like that, that song, Comfortably Numb. But uh, she had that strange experience. So is it venomous or poisonous? Well, let me show you an example of a poisonous sea creature. This is a little toby I photographed. It's a type of little, cute little puffer fish in the Solomon Islands. This would be a poisonous fish. It can't impale you with a spine or anything, but you don't want to eat it or any other puffer because uh, they, could, they're potentially, uh, they have potentially deadly neurotoxin, tetrodotoxin. Whereas this photo by Andy, um, the flap paddle scorpion fish, you can look at the spines and see. It's a kindly looking thing, it, and, and, it, and it's, it won't attack you. It's just sitting on the bottom, minding its own business, looking like a cartoon character in this case. And uh, that's purely defensive. So that's an example of a venomous animal. So venom, by definition, must be injected using a spine or little harpoon, little darts, some things I'll tell you about later. And what is venom? Greg, what is venom? It's a poison. And, but not all, all, all venoms are poisons, but not all poisons are venoms because of the, the need for an inject, thank you, Greg, an injection system and usually some kind of poison gland. Venoms are mostly concoctions of proteins and peptides and multi complex cocktails of chemicals. Um, one of the animals that I've taken interest in, uh, interest in injects, it's a snail, but it injects insulin into a fish. And part of the discovery was finding out that it, it has the insulin inside the snail's body is not like snail insulin. I didn't even know if they have insulin. It's like fish insulin, and it will immediately lower the blood pressure of the fish and potentially uh, becomes dinner. A couple different kinds of venoms. The neurotoxins, as it suggests, affect the nervous system. That would be like, let's see, out here on the California freeway, so your whole California, Southern California freeway system. A neurotoxin is like what would happen if you immediately closed all the entrances and exits to the freeway and all the cars stopped and just got stuck there. Southern California might be in tough shape for a while. On the other hand, hand a hematoxin is one that affects the circulatory system. That would be like Southern California freeway system, but the freeway would crumble and all the cars would just fall apart. Um, the cars representing blood cells. So neurotoxins, nervous system, hematoxins, your circulatory system. Some animals have a little of both. One huge group of animals that are well known, jellyfish family or the anemone family, uh, phylum I should say, big group of thousands of animals, uh, have, uh, have stingers. Uh, they used to be called Salenterata, was uh, the name of the phylum for you biologists. It was changed to Nidaria, meaning Nid, C N I D, the C is silent, referring to, uh, I think the origin of the word is the nettle, the plant, the nettle. So that's Nidaria. This is a beautiful anemone photographed by Andy with all the little residents there. And I was out in Fiji with a wonderful person, Stephen Webster, from he was one of the founders of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I was diving with him, and he accidentally had a little run-in with an anemone. I had no idea how powerful a sting these anemones had. And here's what he recalls. 
I was filming something above an anemone called a Heteractus magnifica and didn't notice the anemone until I was hit in my knee with what felt like a hot poker. Hydrocortisone cream and triple rum drinks eventually took care of the pain. <laughs> Maybe some of you know Stephen. Funny guy and great to travel with. So I, was, I, was, I didn't realize how much, how badly these could sting people. I think he even had like a lycra suit on and it went right through that. And uh, he had a rash for a few days and finally got over it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a fun dive. And here's, here's how it works. Uh, this is a very ancient group of animals going back about 600 million years. And people refer to animals like jellyfish as simple. Well, every animal is endlessly complex. It's a relative term. So even um, in a simple animal like um, a sea anemone or a jellyfish that has these, well, this is, this is what it has. This is one example of the thousands of stinging cells they have on their tentacles. This is called a nidocyte. And right in the middle here is called a nematocyst. And some kinds of nematocysts, some of them will just grab parts of an animal. But many of them have this dart packaged inside. There's a little trigger here, either mechanical, certain mechanical triggers or chemicals will trigger it. And it fires out at about 700 nanoseconds, 700 billionths of a second. It's one of the fastest mechanisms ever measured in, in biology. And out flies a tube at about 400 miles an hour. And it's capable of going through a crab's shell. Very powerful and very long. If I had a nematocyst this big here, like the size of a water glass, the tube would probably reach to the wall over there and it injects the venom through that tube. And that's what happened to Stephen Webster when he put his knee in the anemone by accident, probably a few thousand times, all at once. Jellyfish are part of pop culture. Some of you uh, may have, maybe anybody Sherlock Holmes fan out there? Uh, yeah. this. Uh, this is called the lion's mane. It's very common in New England. I don't know if you have them here along the Pacific coast. It's an Arctic, or um, they get very big up in the Arctic and often come down with currents. And in this Sherlock Holmes adventure, they found a, uh, a deceased person on the beach. Spoiler alert, turns out it wasn't um, some nefarious act of a human that did him in, it was a lion's mane. However, and this is true with most jellyfish, um, you'll, it's, it, lion's mane won't kill you. It'll just hurt you a lot, unless you have some kind of allergic reaction or heart problem or something like that. And they do get to be about six feet across. Their tentacles get to be 100 feet long. And what they'll do sometimes is float, float along like a UFO. I believe in UFOs. Uh, and over, over other jellyfish, like moon jellies and the tentacles will catch a group of jellies below it and then just bring them up to eat them, like back to the mothership. Yeah, I believe in UFOs. Now you're gonna believe anything I say tonight? <laughs> okay, I shouldn't have told you that. And the most famous, let's say potentially lethal jellyfish is the box jelly. This is Chironex flicari from Australia. The bell here gets to be about a foot across and about 10, the tentacles will go about 10 feet long. And uh, very, very, uh, very dangerous. There's also uh, a strange thing that was going on in Australia. As long as, his, as history books have been written, there's a tribe called the Irukandji tribe in Australia near Queensland. And they would come to the hospital from people from this, um, the Irukandji people would show up in the hospital with terrible symptoms. I won't go into all the symptoms except it's terrible pain and really bad symptoms. And they couldn't figure out why. 
and it was called, whoops, it's called the Irukandji Syndrome. So back in 1961, a person named Jack Barnes, tough guy, he'd been in combat, uh, he was uh, no shrinking violet. He wanted to do an experiment because he found these small box jellies, two, maybe two inches long, and he thought that that might be the origin of the mystery uh, syndrome, Irukandji syndrome. So he let one stung him, uh, sting him. Uh, he also let his son get stung and a lifeguard and they all spent about three days in the hospital writhing in pain and probably cursing at Jack to saying that really wasn't a good idea. Um, but they did prove the origin of uh, at least a connection between this particular species and the Irukandji syndrome. The problem is that they're hard to, really hard to see in the water. They're so small and clear. And it's seasonal, so if these, if you ever go to Australia, I wouldn't worry about these things, because if they're around, there'll be uh, signs on the beach to say, don't swim here. Go down where there's a, a curtain, we're keeping jellies out, you can swim further down the beach. I got interested in, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, I don't want to go get too long-winded here, I'll make it quick. Uh, I got interested in venomous animals when I was in the Red Sea. And we were going on a night dive around midnight, Egyptian waters, but over by Saudi Arabia. And it just occurred to me before we went in, I said to the other divers, because I was one of the trip leaders, I said, if you see a little thing looks like an ice cream cone, don't pick it up. For two reasons. One, we, di we were diving in a reserve, a marine reserve, where you can't touch anything. You don't want to touch anything. The other thing is that it can do you in. And I said, don't want, to, don't want to pick it up. I don't know if they're here or not, just don't, don't touch it. Well, I jumped in with my camera, and in about 10 minutes, I found this very cone snail that I photographed moving up a slope out hunting, probably hunting for other snails. So I got, I got close to it, and I was, when you have a light at night, it's a modeling light before you use your flash, it, it, it attracts little fish. And so I'm in this fish ball, and I'm trying to shoot through the fish. So I'm getting closer and closer and closer to this, this uh, venomous snail, and yow, I felt a sting in my finger. And I was really ignorant about the animal. I didn't know anything about it. I'm just thinking, I hope it didn't somehow shoot me with a stinger or something, because it's lethal. Turned out it was just like a jellyfish tentacle that got stuck in my glove pulled it out later, but turns out that it's harder to get, you really have to kind of work on it to get stung with one of these. This is an example of a fish-eating cone snail, like Conus geographicus. And if you can imagine having a garden and having a land snail pick a hummingbird out of the air, that would be pretty weird. It's like, wow, that's quite a snail. But in the ocean, that's pretty much what happens with fish eating cone snails. They have a siphon. They kind of smell what's in the water, especially if a fish is nearby, some of the molecules it picks up. Then what it does is it projects a proboscis out, and the proboscis is loaded with a harpoon that's full of venom. Looks like it was manufactured in New Bedford for the uh, whaling industry. But that's one right there. It's re a remarkable structure. And the fish is instantly paralyzed. And a mouth opens up around the proboscis. And it happens very quickly. That snail will eat that fish. Turns out. At the University of Utah, a lot of work has been put into cone snail venoms. And there was one, I say kid, he was just out of high school. He went to the lab where this was going on at the University of Utah, just picked up a job. And he was at the spectrometer, the machine that figures out all the different components of all the different chemicals in, a, in, a, in venom. And he found one that was particularly interesting, and they isolated it. Now, this is 
This is a kid who's not even in college yet, but he basically found it. And it's called zinconitide. It's the first pain-killing drug from the cone snail. And a lot of scientists are looking at peptide, the peptide, these small little, basically short proteins that attack the nervous system, the human nervous system, so precisely that you can stop pain without other side effects. It's like a micro, it's like instead of taking a, um, a meat cleaver to do surgery, it's like taking a tiny little microscopic instrument to do the surgery. So this looks like it may be opening up a whole new generation of, uh, of painkillers that uh, they're non-opiates, which is a good thing. That's an example of biomimicry, also called biomimetics. I like biomimicry, it's easier. to. Biomimicry is the imitation of nature's models and systems, basically stealing nature's trade secrets for the purpose of solving complex human problems. And this is becoming uh, a, a, a giant endeavor between marine biologists, scientists everywhere, biologists, and engineers. I'd like to give you an example of, uh, of biomimicry here. This is a deep sea sponge. It's a glass sponge. And this animal lives in very deep water, up to maybe 15,000 feet. Freezing cold, total always dark. It's able to spin glass fibers using silica, uh, silicon from seawater, silicate. It turns it into glass, uh, silicon dioxide, at very low temperatures. And by the way, this is, this is given as a gift in Japan when they're brought up from the bottom sometimes. And I'll tell you why. A sh two shrimp will move into, uh, the larva of the shrimp will move into one of these uh, tubes and start to grow. And it protects them. They're inside this glass house their whole lives. And they're safe. But they can't get out. And that is the reason um, the Japanese have been known to give this wedding gift to symbolize the uh, blessed prison of marriage. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> but if you take a close look at the fibers, it looks like fiber optics. And in some cases, the fiber op optics created by this glass sponge are better than what's been developed so far. For one thing, you can also take sodium from seawater, for you chemists, and make the fiber, the glass, clearer, easier for light to pass through. But when we make fiber, oh, it's also not, not as breakable as you can practically tie the strands in a little, a little knot. Um, you can't do that with the fiber optics that deliver our media. So scientists at Bell Laboratories uh, has, have been working on this and uh, trying to improve fiber optics and a lot of other places. And uh, a lovely example of biomimicry to advance human technology. And here you can steal the trade secrets that go back 600 million years and you won't even get arrested. Another type of biomimicry that I, I find really interesting, I'd like to share with you. It's really exciting is, can you see the octopus here? As you probably know from being associated with an aquarium, cephalopods, um, octopus and squid, and other, and cuttlefish, are, have tremendous camouflage, almost beyond belief. This one is even more camouflaged. Can you see where it is there? I'm going to circle it here. Tentacles are down in this area. It turns out, uh, and I think some of this research has even gone down, uh, ha has occurred down in Irvine at um, one of the facilities there. 
So scientists, engineers, biologists are working in various parts of the world now to create real-time camouflage. That means they're creating a thin nanofilm, a very, very, very thin film that mimics the endlessly complex skin of, say, a cephalopod, uh, such as a cuttlefish. That means when a cuttlefish, if it moves across, say, this room, it'll be camouflaged all the way because it'll match whatever background it's next to. And apparently, it's not just the eyes that are picking up the background. It's sensory cells throughout its skin. It's almost like seeing through your skin. Well, wouldn't it be nice if uh, there was a technology that you could wear or put on a vehicle that matched its background as it moved? And that's one of the, uh, the goals. So the defense industry is very interested in that, um, as is law enforcement for catching bad guys. I, th I think that would be quite a tool. Uh, I'd like to uh, just show you a few more of Andrew's photos. I really want to showcase Andrew, Andrew's work from the book. Right now, it's this, as we speak, he's probably diving, he's probably underwater in the Philippines right now. This is a member of the scorpionfish family, lionfish, scorpionfish, stonefish, living on the bottom, minding their own business, using these spines for protection. That's called a sea wasp, not to be confused with the box jelly, Cuba medusa, um, that goes by the same name. They're terrific when it comes to camouflage. A weedy scorpion fish. And Andrew also captured this venomous sea urchin. It's called a fire urchin. Yeah, look at those colors. And like clownfish or anemone fish, as you know, they are able to live inside the stinging tentacles of anemones. And a, a type of symbiosis, the uh, anemone gets oxygenated and uh, the fish gets protection. Here's a crab that finds protection among the venomous spines of the fire urchin. And I'm going to show you where it is. You probably can see it already, but its legs are down here. Come around like this. Here's a claw. And that's a crab. It lives between the the spines. Works. Great example of adaptation. Well, why are animals venomous? Why? Well, it's one of these, uh, these questions that really you can spend the rest of your life trying to answer, but um, it may have to do with energetics. So if you take an animal that's got teeth and claws, pred predation tooth and claw, like a tiger, and powerful muscles. It uses a lot of energy to get its prey. Well, what if you can save the energy just by synthesizing venoms? So it's like a David and Goliath thing. One of these little things can bring down a big animal like us. So it's, it's a remarkable adaptation, and it may have to do with the energetics, that it's saving energy, but it takes energy to make the venom, to synthesize the venom. So it's an equation science biologists are still trying to work out. Also in the, uh, the book, we've tried to show some, some venomous animals you, the marine, biology, uh, marine biological community may have not seen. This is a venomous creature called a remipede. It's the first venomous crustacean ever discovered in caves in the Bahamas. And it's got little fangs up here. And also this strange one that we came across researching the book. It's called a one, um, a one, I'll find the name for it because it escapes me right now. Nigel, it's Nigel. Nigel's one-jawed eel. Has no upper jaw, but it does have a fang that's venomous. Don't have to worry about this unless you're down about 5,000 feet and it's only about two inches long. So unless you're diving in a submarine, you decide to go outside the submarine. Uh, 
Don't have to worry about this guy. Well, just so uh, you don't think that all the stuff in the ocean is scary, I'd like to leave you with uh, some imagery taken over the years in various places, uh, set to a little bit of music, WC Claire de Lune. So if you want to bring up the audio, feel free. We have time for a few questions. Raise a hand and I'll bring a microphone to you or Linda Will in the back. Who has the first one? Right over there, okay. So you were talking about like with the octopus, it has bacteria in the saliva. Are most venomous animals in the ocean, um, they have that through the bacteria or is it mostly protein th synthesis that causes those neurotoxins or hemotoxins? Good question, mostly protein synthesis. In the case of the cephalopods, like the blue-ringed octopus and the, and the sal salivary glands, uh, that particular neur neurotoxin created by bacteria also, uh, sometimes it's um, bioaccumulation too, from things that the animals that eat, are, uh, it's eating that already have the tetrodotoxin. I'm not sure about the puffers and how that's synthesized. But you are right to suggest, yeah, most venoms are protein, very complex protein synthesis case of the cone snails, there's 500 species, each cone snail might have 50 different peptides to take a look at. That's, that's a lot of chemistry to look at in the future. By the way, I wanted to mention, um, I went through your Pacific Visions part of the aquarium today. I think it's, it's, it's not only terrific, uh, in my personal opinion, but uh, you've got to see it if you haven't because it's one of these, it's one of the few environmental stories, it's really kind of a story in a way, the, the movie's great, both of them, but you come out feeling good instead of coming out feeling like, oh, that's it's all over, folks, that's all, folks. 
it's not like that. It's a, a really good, a good experience. And also, I'd like to know whoever's raising your living corals here is a genius. Never seen your, t we went through your tanks today in the tropical gallery and just jaw dropped. Um, yeah, any other questions while you're at it? Yeah. Go ahead, Francis. Well, I wanted to commend you on your presentation and the, the part toward the end that was just so moving. I'll remember forever. Um, this Thank is you. the subject matter I'm not real familiar with, so I learned a lot from you. And so when the, the venom was injected into the crabfish, and then it eats the crabfish. Does it not absorb the venom from their system and it does become null or void? And I was wondering, do they ever have venomous creatures and poisonous ones that um, attack one another? And, and how do they know not to be trying to attack them or do they learn the hard way? Thank Boy, you. Boy, that's, that's a good question. Uh, most of it above my pay grade. But apparently some animals like the blue-ringed octopus can tolerate their own, their own toxin. They're immune to it. Uh, as far as the second part of your question, I don't know. <laughs> I, wish I, could, I wish I knew the answer to that. It's very, a very complex question. You ask a good question. And thank you for your words, uh, your kind words. You just made my day. My week, maybe my month. Thank you. Other questions? Anybody? Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. It's been a blast. And Paul, thank you. Great, great photographs, great story. And thank you, Jerry. thank you very much for being thank here. You. So I guess we'll be and signing books somewhere. Yeah, Linda, go ahead. OK, if you'll come out the back door here, and we'll go around to the gift store from the back, you can buy the book. And uh, there'll be a seat for him uh, to sign the books there. And you have to leave that way anyhow. <laughs>